There we go. All right. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, today we'll be talking about ClickHouse and Superset. Um, and there's a fun kind of collaboration story there as well uh, around getting the, the driver to play nicely. And, um, and we actually just a month ago gave a talk together as well at Percona Live um, on, a, on a similar overlapping set of topics. So thanks, Robert, for, for being here. And I'll let you take it away. Great. Thanks, Rini. It's, it's uh, great to be back and doing another talk together. Yeah, so um, as Rini said, we'll be talking about um, visualizing real-time data using ClickHouse and Superset. Let's do a little bit of a intro here. So I am CEO at Altinity. Uh, we are a company that supports ClickHouse for enterprises. We do everything from running in the cloud to do training to engineer features. Um, actually, a lot of similarities to the work that uh, the preset does. Uh, what's more important for this talk is I'm a database geek. I've been working on databases since 1983. I uh, had some detours into things like visualization and, and security, and ClickHouse is database number 20. So, uh, Srini? Hey, yeah, quick intro here. So, Srini uh, Karamati, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, my background's in, in data science and statistics, uh, and I have a, a big love for visualization, uh, my background, as well as in data science education. So I'm here to help people learn how to be effective with data. Um, thanks. Yeah, this is good. Yeah, and just um, uh, so on my side, introducing uh, ClickHouse SQL Data Warehouse, open source uh, uh, SQL Data Warehouse. I like to describe it as the first one that can play with the big kids. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it um, in uh, further on in the talk, but uh, some of the details you can read here and uh, we'll dig into that in my section of the talk. Awesome, cool. Let's click to the next slide. Great, so I'll kind of provide a quick overview of, of DataViz, like why we're here, talk about Superset um, as well for people who are new to it. And then um, Robert will talk about ClickHouse. So you can advance to the next slide. So uh, the main thing that I wanna, I want people to take away here is that the main purpose of data science really is insight. Uh, I, I think a lot of days now, you know, nowadays you hear about uh, large amounts of data or doing cool things with machine learning. And I think all those things are valid, uh, but ultimately, you know, most businesses do need uh, insights from what's going on in their business as well as, you know, the rest of the world. And uh, so, you know, I always come back to insight as being the main driver of, of data efforts. And I think that's how organizations should be thinking of things. And I think Superset is kind of a natural tool here to help help there. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, Superset's a BI tool and you know it's effective data visualization is kind of uh, one of the best ways to get insight from a large complex amount of data. Here's some kind of fun examples that I've I put together on the slide uh, spanning everything from Star Wars to video game sales, uh, and I'm in Massachusetts myself, so I'm always looking at my own internal dashboard of our total vaccinations here uh, since COVID is, is thankfully winding down in the United States and, and kind of the rest of the world. Um, you go to the next slide. So I'll provide a quick overview of Superset and, uh, and how it works and the different kind of flavors and, and workflows. Um, next slide. So Superset is a modern open source BI platform uh, it was originally created by Maxime Bouchemin, uh, who was the original creator of Apache Airflow. Um, and now he also cr created Apache Superset at Airbnb. Um, he just can't stop uh, open sourcing cool data tools. And uh, the, the really cool thing about Superset is it pretty much works with any SQL speaking data engine. Uh, and that's thankfully uh, due to the bet that the community made early on on SQL Alchemy as being an important platform and a huge kind of diversity of charts uh, that are also extendable. So the biggest thing I would say Superset uh, offers to um, in, in the open source kind of BI space is just how extensible it is um, in terms of both the, the kind of the simplistic things like supporting new databases uh, and supporting a large variety of chart types, but also how it can be used and embedded in many different contexts and uh, we've even speaking to companies and projects building entire businesses uh, on this kind of BI platform, which is super exciting. Get advanced to the next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, SQL Alchemy 
and uh, Python DB API 2.0 are kind of two important um, kind of bets that the community has made. And this really lets a superset work with kind of a wide variety of databases. And it also is kind of one of the reasons why uh, when the ClickHouse community and the superset community were trying to kind of figure out how to, how to work together and make sure the integration was working well, um, having a shared standard, shared set of standards uh, really uh, made, made sure that that process was very smooth. Um, a lot of tools end up building native connectors and there's, you know, there's definitely pros and cons to that approach. Uh, but in terms of speed, in terms of letting Superset work with every new database that's coming out um, and work super well, um, shared standards is, is super critical. Next slide. So the, there's kind of two main workflows in Superset. You have SQL Lab, which is a state-of-the-art browser-based SQL ID. So this is really focused on writing analytical queries, so kind of more read-only focus, as is common in a lot of BI tools. So exploring data, sculpting data and preparing it for visualization, and then saving that data um, as virtual data sets, database views, or database tables. So this is really where people who are savvy with SQL, who wanna take things to the next level, reshape their data, um, they're kind of empowered to do so. And um, this, this kind of IDE for SQL keeps, keeps getting better. Uh, after you are able to reshape and re sculpt your data for visualization, Superset has this thin semantic layer uh, where you can publish virtual data sets. So if you need to, um, if you need to kind of save it at the, the semantic layer instead of you know pushing it down to your database and saving it as a view, um, you can do that, which is kind of a very common thing that a lot of BI tools have. And in the coming months, there's there's a lot of exciting developments to make the semantic layer even more powerful. So this is kind of something that's really unique to Superset um, in terms of the kind of open source BI landscape. Once you have your data prepped, uh, you can use uh, Superset's Explore View. So this is a no code chart builder. Um, and again, betting on open standards, SQL Alchemy was a really important enabler of this functionality because building there's entire companies and projects just focused on doing no code chart building, no code query building, um, leveraging what's already been done in the SQL Alchemy community and all the dialects means that um, Superset's able to offer a really powerful front end in this Explorer view uh, to let really everyone in an organization create charts uh, without even needing to code. This is kind of uh, to end kind of the Superset part of this, this is kind of a fun, uh, example of uh, a visualization. So this is out of date screenshot, but this is kind of the Slack community dashboard that we use um, at preset to understand the superset Slack community. And so this, this dashboard is something that I built in about 10 minutes. Uh, and that kind of just showcases the, the power and how kind of attractive the charts are in, in superset. As you. Okay, I'll jump in. Thank you so much, Trini. So um, we're kind of assuming that most people on this call have some uh, acquaintance with Superset. So we've gone over that pretty quickly. And what we'll now do is spend most of the rest of the talk talking about ClickHouse and how to integrate it. So what I'd like to do first is just talk a little bit about ClickHouse because I assume that there are a few people on this on this call that have, have never heard of it um, and perhaps even more who have not used it. So um, ClickHouse is a new option for building analytic services. And by an analytic service, I just mean something that you can present to your users and get, uh, uh, you know, sort of get answers from large pools of data. And one way to look at it is it's an industrial strength data warehouse. It's also open sourced under the Apache 2 license, just like Superset. And there's a number of important characteristics, but I think if you had to pick three, one is that it's incredibly uh, accessible for developers. Uh, like Superset, it's just something you can spin up by yourself. There's also cloud versions of it, of course, uh, but it'll install on a laptop in 60 seconds. So you can basically pull it down as a, a either as a, um, you know, install it on Ubuntu on your on a Linux VM, uh, or you can go ahead and run it through Docker. The other things it runs pretty much anywhere Linux does. Uh, we have examples of it running in everything from an Android phone to uh, clusters that contain hundreds of nodes. It runs great in containers, it runs on bare metal, it runs in the cloud. So you have a lot of choices about where you can deploy it. Again, very similar to Superset. 
And then finally, and this is the thing that really grabs people by the collar when they first use it, it's incredibly fast. So you can get answers to queries literally in milliseconds on data sets that contain billions or trillions of rows. And this enables, in fact, in some cases, this enables entirely new applications to be built because you can answer questions well within the time that it takes to, for example, display a web page. So that means that you can be looking at these pools of data and making decisions about what you show people on the fly. So digging into it a little bit more, some of the specific uh, features that make it very powerful is, first of all, it's very simple. So the basic distribution is just a C++ binary. I sometimes like to say it's kind of like MySQL and Vertica, which is another popular data warehouse. Uh, pretend they had a kid. Uh, well, from the MySQL side, it has the same ease of installation and just a single statically linked binary that will basically run anywhere that, that Linux does. Second, it has an advanced SQL implementation. Like most analytic databases, it's very focused on select, things like updates, deletes, um, other features are not so um, not so prominent. It uses column storage, which is tremendously important for large data sets because it enables uh, high compression. So we have uh, not only do we have multiple ways to compress data, but we also have things called codecs, which allow you to apply transformations that basically will take the air out of your data and make a much smaller thing to compress so that you can sometimes get compression levels on the order of hundreds of times the original data size. It's very good at distributing processing, both across nodes as well as uh, using all the cores locally. It also uses vectorization, which is the ability to sp split things up into pieces, uh, process them as arrays where you use SIMD instructions, which are single instruction, multiple data, uh, which means that you can, for example, if you're summing numbers, you can do four or eight at a time on a single reg in, a, in a, a single clock cycle as opposed to pulling everything into registers one by one. Sharding and replication, scaling. Um, you run it on a laptop, as I said, that starts in 60 seconds, but then you can take that system and expand it out with the same code uh, and essentially the same um, operations out to hundreds of nodes. And then of course it's Apache 2.0. And the way that the community is structured, it's unlikely that will ever change. It's become very popular. So for those of you on the call, I I'm sure there's some of you that have recently heard about it. I show a few of the logos of just some of the thousands of companies that are currently using it. One that's particularly prominent and will come up again in this talk is Cloudflare. They were one of the early adopters in the United States. And this quote is something that uh, John uh, Graham Cumming, their CTO post posted about a year ago on Hacker News. So they've made a big, um, basically all of the analytics that they serve up to their customers are driven off ClickHouse. So, one more thing about it is just a little about the community. So like, um, like Srini and, and the preset folks really big into open source, we're riding on top of this huge community that evolved from what was originally an in-house project at Yandex. That's how ClickHouse was developed. They, they had a web analytics project. Uh, they were looking for a database or a data warehouse that could, could serve data quickly for it, couldn't find one, so they wrote one. They open sourced it in 2016, and it has grown very rapidly since then. So these are just some sort of common metrics. I think one that's particularly interesting is if you look at the unique GitHub project uh, contributors each year. Uh, in other words, and, and the thing I'm measuring here is the the people who have um, you know sort of filed a PR against the ClickHouse code base. We've grown really rapidly, and in fact. Um, my numbers run up to April 20th of this year, where we were exactly equal to the number of contributors on Elasticsearch. So this community has grown very rapidly and is now by some measures, the same size as, as Elasticsearch. So that's a little bit about ClickHouse and why you should care. What I'd like to do now is talk about how we actually connect it up with ClickHouse. And as Srini mentioned, ClickHouse has made this commitment to SQL Alchemy so what you're going to need to do is install a SQL Alchemy driver. And uh, the basic architecture is shown here. We're going to be working with the ClickHouse SQL Alchemy driver, uh, which also is written in Python. It uses something underneath called the ClickHouse driver. And then what that does is that driver, which is the thing that actually takes care of doing the, the network connectivity and, and talking the wire, speaking the wire protocol, it will then talk to ClickHouse. 
And ClickHouse, just so you know, has a couple of ports that it stand that it uses for this particular protocol. This is called the TCP IP or the TCP native protocol. Uh, port 9000 is for communications in the clear. 9440 is, is for TLS encrypted uh, communications. So this is a good time to, to dig in just a little bit into the drivers because there are actually two of them. Um, the driver that was originally used with Superset most commonly was developed at um, Cloudflare by Marek Favruza. And he contributed this uh, uh, probably back in 2017, something like that. Um, it's called SQL Alchemy ClickHouse. And this is the one that's documented on the site. I th think uh, that that's gonna change or, or our, the, the other driver will be uh, documented soon. But uh, things to note about it is that it uses what's called the HTTP interface, which is a different interface uh, that you can use to talk to ClickHouse. Doesn't matter a lot, but a couple of key things is it doesn't have TLS support, that is important. And it also is has a lot less maintenance on it. The last PyPy.org release was in 2018. So it's pretty, you basically have to go get the code yourself if you want anything newer. Uh, what we recommend at this point is to use a newer driver called ClickHouse SQL Alchemy. Uh, we chose these names to confuse our enemies. Um, but this is uh, also Apache 2.0 developed by a guy called Konstantin Lebedev. And uh, this is one that we support at Altinity. Um, it has TLS support. It has a bunch of bug fixes that we put in uh, with uh, Srini and Max and, and uh, the help of other people at, uh, in the Superset community. And it's very actively maintained. So the last release, um, when, I, when we put these slides together was uh, March 15th. There may even have been one since then. So it's a really, I give that one two stars. This is the one where if you're starting out on Superset, I would highly recommend using this uh, because it does uh, address a number of problems that people have hit in the past. So setting it up is totally easy. Um, this is an example of the commands that I run when I'm on my Ubuntu laptop, uh, when I'm doing real work as opposed to uh, manager work, which I do on Windows, but you'll just go ahead and follow the install instructions. These are documented on the Superset site. Um, I usually, I, like every sane person, I do this in a virtual environment. Uh, I don't show those commands. I figure you know that if, if you're familiar with Python. So this sets up superset. And then before we get too far in and kick it off, we want to go ahead and just install the, uh, do a pip install, get ClickHouse SQL Alchemy up. You want to get the latest version, which is greater than or equal to 0.1.6. That has the bug fixes I mentioned. And then you start superset and bang, you're off and running. And at that point, you can now connect from the superset, uh, you know, through the UI, go ahead and connect to ClickHouse. So I'm going to go ahead and show how that works. Uh, oh, first I'm going to talk about uh, connection strings. So SQL Al Alchemy, like all self-respecting uh, connectivity APIs, has a URL format. Uh, you're probably familiar with it if you've connected with other databases. This is the format for the uh, for the ClickHouse SQL Alchemy driver. So it's ClickHouse bus native. That's the selector or the scheme to get uh, to make sure you get the right driver. And here's a couple examples that you can use if you're just running ClickHouse on your laptop, where it runs great, as I've mentioned multiple times. You can just use a very simple um, uh, form where you're, the the host is localhost and you connect to the default database. So that's about as simple as these get. What you can also do if you're just playing around with this and you don't want to bother with installing ClickHouse is this second URL connects to a public endpoint that we maintain that has some interesting data sets, uh, taxi data, airline data, uh, that actually some of these, the GitHub data that I was referring to previously are just out there. You can connect to this any place that you have an internet connection. So these are two you can try. Of course, if you have your own uh, ClickHouse servers, you can form the URL, uh, the URL appropriately and connect to them. The database connection page is very straightforward. Um, this is one of the things I, I, this is one of the things where I think the superset community has just done an amazing job of, of making this super easy to do. Um, connecting to ClickHouse is just, you go into the databases page, press add database, form pops up. You're going to go ahead and, uh, you know, give it a name and then type your URL in. I always, as a matter of practice, do a test connection just to make sure I got it right. Um, that's a, that ensures me that the thing actually connects and then you press add. At that point, you're done. You're basically ready to talk to, uh, to um, 
ClickHouse and you can now have some fun with ClickHouse data. And that's what we'll do for the rest of this talk is, is discuss exactly how you can do that. Just showing some simple examples and then what's going on under the covers. If you're a ClickHouse person, it's kind of nice to know what the driver is doing for you and, and, and why it works. So before I go into the two examples, I just like to give a kind of conceptual overview of what the pieces are in in superset that we'll be dealing with in these examples. And <clears throat> I like to think of it as, this is not from superset documentation, this is just something I cooked up to kind of explain it to uh, to myself as well as other, uh, other ClickHouse users. But you can think of the base as being the database object. That's the thing that connects you. And then there's two ways that you can get data as, um, as Srini mentioned one, the virtual data set, but there's also physical data sets. And we'll talk about those um, in just a minute. So these data sets are kind of like, are the semantic layer that actually go fetch the data for you and can cache it. They, they basically um, give you kind of the cube structure and then the charts attached to those and that's your individual displays. And then you can link them all together in dashboards. And that's your final thing that you show to your users. So this is the structure. And what we're going to have to do is create each of these pieces, link them together, and then we'll have a nice dashboard. We don't have to do the database because we just did that um, a minute ago. But what I'm going to do is start with a basic time series chart. Uh, for ClickHouse, this is one of the first things you're probably going to want to do. Most, most data in Click, ClickHouse is time ordered in some way. So we're going to show how to create a basic chart that, that displays it. And there's, there's three steps. It's really quick. Um, we're going to create a database. We already did that, so we won't have to show that again. We're going to create what's called a physical data set. This is going to point to a ClickHouse table. And we're not going to have to, uh, unlike uh, what Srini showed a few slides back, we don't even have to um, go in and look at SQL. This will just connect straight to the data and or to the table, and then we'll be able, be able to build charts directly from that table. And then finally, we'll create the chart. The cool thing about this ste these steps is you don't have to write any code. And one of the reasons I like this is I, I I like looking for or finding options where people who are not necessarily SQL gurus can still come to ClickHouse and get valuable information out of it without um, without having to write a bunch of SQL. So let's go through the, the two final steps. So the first one, the second step in that process was to create the physical data set. This is very straightforward. I'm using this public endpoint. So I've, if you go into the data sets section um, in, the, in, the, um, in Superset, you just uh, add a data set. There's a plus data set that you can press. You select the database connection that here's our ClickHouse public endpoint, which we already made. You select the schema in ClickHouse parlance, that would be the database. So we're gonna select the default database and then pick a table. That's it. You just press add and in it goes. So um, once you do that, you're basically gonna get pushed back to this data sets view. And the last data set that you created is just gonna be at the top of the view. And so there it is on time. It was just created a minute ago. So to make a chart, all we have to do is click on that. It's really easy. And you click on it. And what will happen is you'll be bounced into this chart view. And you can now create a time series chart. So uh, you have to play around with it a little bit. The first thing you do is you select the chart type, which is time series. Uh, since it's time, you're going to have to you know, tell us a little bit about your time dimension. So. Uh, what's the column? Click out, or Superset is very good at recognizing time series um, uh, columns automatically. So they'll, they'll have a little clock beside them. Uh, what's your time grain? So what, what, what level of granularity do you want to view it at? And what's the time range? These are all really easy to, uh, to select. You'll then select a metric, um, which is you know, some measurement or measurements that you want to see. And then finally, you'll select one or more things to group by which are going to be the, you know, sort of break up the data into different series. And um, the result, if you fill this out, you can follow exactly these steps right this instant. If you have superset, you will, uh, you know, once you get done with this, you'll see a nice uh, chart, which shows you in this case, I've called it flights per month. Um, what normally will come up is a line chart, but I'm a kind of a stacked uh, bar chart kind of guy. So I always quickly go in and you can go in and customize and make it a nice uh, bar chart, but there's your data. 
And the cool thing about this, the thing, as I say, I really like is I didn't write any sequel to, to get this. This is, as, as Srini says, this is a no code, um, uh, no code uh, operation. As a database person though, I kind of love to know what's going on under the cover just to make sure it's, I mean, you know, just to make sure it's doing the right thing. I'm not naturally paranoid, but I guess I am a little bit, but I'm very curious. So what happens is uh, one of the things that's really cool about, about Superset is when they're, you know, when you're in this chart, you can go find out what the query is that got generated just by going over to these little lines here that I'm uh, wiggling my cursor around and you just press that button you'll see a, a drop down and it says view query if you punch that you're going to see the exact query that got generated and what i like about this is i look at this and i say hey this is well formed sql i feel like this is the same sql essentially that i would have written if i were doing this myself so that makes me feel pretty confident that under the covers this is doing the right thing so that's basically our time series chart. That's it. You know, if you have the data out there, you have a big fact table and it's already got all the things that you, you know, it's got everything denormalized into it. This might be all you need to do to generate time series charts. Um, you don't have to go in a SQL lab or anything like that. You can already get useful information out of it. What's interesting though, is to look at something more in depth. So there are cases where as Srini said, we want to sculpt the data. We want to add additional information to it. And I'll, I'll show you exactly what we want to add to make this more interesting. But in that case, we're going, since it's going to be based on a query, we're going to need to create what's called a virtual data set. That points to a ClickHouse query. And then that query in turn can reference as many tables as it needs to fetch the information we're interested in. And then we'll create the chart on top of that in that particular case, what it's going to do is create a, a ClickHouse query, which then references, uh, basically references subqueries or a, a subquery which represents the um, the virtual data set. And when I type these slides up, I got them slightly backwards, but you'll see what I mean in just a second. So. What we're going to do is show an example of why you would a more concrete example of why you would want to do this. So I'm going to build a query that act, answers multiple questions. And I'm sure that everybody um, can see instantly by reading this that what this is doing is fetching canceled and delayed flights. And it is going ahead and taking the arrival points and the destination points and it's adding latitude and longitude to them. This is useful because in addition to giving us a couple of nice metrics to look at, like how often do flights get canceled, we can see the exact locations of the airports and maybe put them on a map. I was just kidding about this being totally easy to read. Let me show you a picture. This is actually what we're doing. So we have this on-time data set, which, which contains flight data. And what we're doing is joining it with another table called airports. And there's a field called IATA, IATA that's the, the code like SFO or DFW that, uh, that we use to designate the airport. We can join on that and then we can gather in the latitude and the longitude for both the, arrival, uh, for the, uh, the originating airport and the destination airport. So this shows graphically what we're doing. And this is an example of something that in Superset, you do have to write SQL code to get it because Superset currently doesn't know how to do joins. And anyway, sometimes you need to transform or, or fix up things. So you're going to you're going to want to come down to the code level and, and get it right. So what we're going to do in this case is we're going to jump into SQL lab with that query. And so you'll come in and you'll basically go ahead and enter the query um, and and play around with it because uh, what SQL Lab allows you to do when you when you hit the run button is it'll then show you the data so you can begin to get a sense, hey, is this thing, well, first of all, it's not erroring out. And second, it's returning data that looks roughly like what I expected to see. And um, and there's another nice thing, the, uh, the query editor is pretty smart about columns. So um, you can select the table or tables that you're, you're operating on. You can see here that it's, um, we have both the airports and the on time table. So when you're filling in things, the query, um, the query editor will help you fill in column names and, and do nice things like that. 
Uh, so you play around with this, you get happy with the data, and then what you want to do is go ahead and save the query. So that's fairly straightforward. So you're going to go ahead and save this. So you give it a name, and then you press this save and explore. And what this will do is once you press that, is it's, it's going to jump in and save this as a data, as a virtual data set. This is the simplest way to create virtual data sets. In fact, the, the standard way. So, um, so that's it. Now, now there's more stuff about virtual data sets that we could talk about because you can go in and you can tweak them to add additional metrics and other configuration information. I'm going to skip over that because these are things you can go do for yourself. What we're going to do now is just create a chart on it, which, as it turns out, is really straightforward. So we basically, from the, um, you know, uh, we can go into the data sets view and just click on that virtual data set. And that will just dump us similar to what we did before. It'll just dump us into a new chart, um, which we can then uh, create something interesting. And in this case, what I'm going to do is create a uh, what's called a deck.gl arc chart, which is basically a map that shows the arcs between loca geographic locations. And I picked this for a couple of reasons, but the biggest one is that it, it consumes latitude and longitude. So it matches that data that we're fetching out from that virtual data set. Uh, one thing I should mention, if you're a ClickHouse user and you're doing this in open source, you will need to go off and get a Mapbox token, which you'll then need to pass into Superset when you start it. Uh, this is documented really nicely in the Superset and Preset docs. It's very easy to do. Um, it's, it's just you get the token and then put it in your environment and, and this stuff all works. So um, as far as the chart type, you just select deck.gl uh, arc. You again, give it time dimension information so that we can uh, set the, you know, basically set the range. You have to generate, it's gonna ask you for the fields that represent your latitude and longitude. And then in this particular case, I'm setting a filter because I just wanna do one that shows flights from SFO. And, um, and as soon as you do all that stuff and press run, you're basically gonna see a nice chart like the thing over on the, uh, on the right side. So that's all you have to do to create a, a geographic chart. It's really very, very straightforward. So um, one thing that is interesting to look at is what's, again, what's going on under the covers. So we can do this same thing where we go look at the generated query. Um, and in this case, what we'll see is if you understand how ClickHouse queries work, what's basically going to happen is the chart is going to select all the, um, the fields that it's showing. And it's going to put all the filter conditions in and things like the limit. But then what you'll see in the middle, and I just have this in orange because it's sort of long, is you'll actually see that whole query that we just developed, which is then just selected as a as selected off uh, using a subquery. So this generates a lot of code. It turns out it runs pretty fast. ClickHouse is quite intelligent. And so things like the where clause um, and you know these various filter conditions will just get pushed down into that subquery, so we won't bother to select all the data and then filter it. We'll only get the, we'll at the, you know, initially only filter or only select the data that we actually want to begin with. So this is super efficient and, um, and works very well. Um, here's another of my, I wanted to mention this, one of my favorite superset uh, charts because it's so easy to do as a word cloud. I love this one. So this is coming off the, this is another chart I've created after uh, coming off that same virtual data set. So, um, oops, the, uh, looks like the arrow's pointing, but you select word cloud and then again, give time dimension. What's the, um, you know, what's the, the, you know, the, the, the variable that you're looking at. So in this case, it's the origin, um, that, that's the dimension. Um, and, and then your metric, which is the number of flights, and then things like limits. And basically what this is doing is creating a word cloud because of the way it's sorted that is essentially the busiest airports by departures. So this is totally cool. It takes, uh, you know, it's something that you can literally do in about two minutes and you have this chart and, and you, you, you show some, you know, like a really interesting visualization of this data. So that's, I think, beginning to now sort of trend into just the whole, or to, to sort of go into the whole 
panoply of things that you can do in superset. I, I, Shreen, I don't know how many, I, I think you guys have at least 40 different display types, something like that. It's an absurd number. So yeah, just, sounds about right. <laughs> just a huge a huge amount of a huge number of ways that you can display data imaginatively and then finally putting them in the dashboard is really simple so uh, dashboards is anybody who's used superset you you go in and there's a dashboard editor you can uh, just go ahead and edit the charts and add them in and and then this is and then you go ahead and publish them and this is what you show to your users so this is really powerful the, it was a real pleasure to get involved with um, with uh, using um, a superset. As I said, many more charts. You can make the dashboards as complex as you want. There's also some interesting features in, in superset that I think we may get into in future webinars. One of the things that I find really fascinating is that superset can do caching and clustering. And this addresses one of the kind of impedance mismatches that we get in multi-tenant systems where you underneath your engine is ClickHouse, which is designed to just answer queries as quickly as possible. The way it does this is when a query comes in, it's going to seize as many resources as it's allowed to and just answer that question as quickly as possible. Now, if you have a system that has 10,000 people looking at the data, that can create a problem because if they all come in and do that, that they're all going to be grabbing these resources and there's, there's a, con a concurrency or contention issue for resources. What ClickHouse can, or excuse me, what Superset can do is help a little bit by caching this in the semantic layer, and then people can be referring to that. The queries just get one, run once or run at intervals, and it begins to give you a way of, of solving the multi-tenancy system while still create, having a highly responsive, essentially real-time uh, analytic uh, uh, service for your users. So um, let me just stop one second here's the dashboard that we were talking about so let's uh, expand this up and as i said these things are really delightful to to edit so we can go ahead and edit the dashboard as easily as this um, if we want to add more charts i have my busiest destinations i can just go ahead and bring that over and stick it down here yep did it yep all right let's see if it'll go in there ah not enough space okay so i have to you can just play around the uh, Let's let's make that a little. It'll it'll go below if you yeah. want. It, it, it'll you can add it to a second row if you want. Uh, yeah, that's what I I can add another row, but this is like components, so I can add a row. There we go. Then up. It has to highlight blue. Yeah, when you when when you drag it, you'll see that yep. blue highlight. There you go. Yep. Yeah. There we go. Okay. All right. Now go. now we got a row. Get the chart. I've been more interested in creating the charts themselves <laughs> than uh, than the dashboards, but this is like totally easy. And then we can expand it out, make it nice, um, you know, sort of really, really very nice, very easy to use uh, a chart editor. And and the cool thing again is, as I say, I think where this really, if if I can editorialize, I think what this really opens up for. ClickHouse users is the ability to expose this data to people who are not necessarily ClickHouse experts. And I think that's where the visualization tools, both imaginatively, you know, sort of display things manage imaginatively, but also open up the audience of users. I think this is a really, a really important collaboration between these two types of software. So I'll leave that. I could work on this all day. I really like working with this. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. We'll just go ahead and save it. There it is. Looks very nice. And uh, we'll go back to the, the presentation. So let's put it back in presentation mode. So we've been working together with Srini and the and the preset team on this and, and more broadly the superset community. So we want this to work for everybody. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is that this works completely everything we've shown you works great in open source and that's um, that's our goal on both sides to to um, improve that so the first thing is there are a few bugs um, for example the clickhouse sql alchemy driver there are certain clickhouse tables just to give a concrete example where if you if they use enums and you're using postgres as your back end it will bomb out when it tries to read it convert it to a data set so things like that we need to address um, we need to build out and create more documentation. This webinar is part of it. 
we've written a couple of blog articles, which the uh, Srini kindly pu uh, published on, on the preset side. Those are on the Altinity blog. And we're working on, um, we've also posted docs on our side uh, that help uh, help people just get this stuff set up and connected as quickly as possible. And then more broadly, um, in addition to the open source, one of the things that that we're both interested in is a lot of people like managed services. So we go, we're both working on, we both have managed services. We're working on connecting those seamlessly so that, for example, if you're a preset cloud user, you can connect to altinity.cloud. Um, but of course, you can do it all in open source as well. And it, for both of us, it's it's sort of like run it where it's best for you. Um, we offer this as a service, but it, you don't have to use it. You can get everything that we've described here. And I think that's um, that's it. That, Srini, thank you so much for having me as a guest. It's a it's a pleasure to do this talk, and we'll take questions. Absolutely. So uh, thanks again, Robert, for coming on. Uh, so if you're new to Zoom webinars, you can use the Q&A button in the bottom uh, to ask questions. Um, and yeah, now's, now's, now's the chance. <clears throat> uh, let's see. So did we get the, um, oh, great. Okay. So uh, for those of you who want to use the link to the public data set, uh, yeah, Srini um, uh, shared it. I'll just show you how that link works. This is something, and I think a lot of people have this. This is called the play interface. I'm just hitting that. And if you want to use it, this is a, a, a simple web UI that's native to, Cl to ClickHouse itself. What you do is press the your account name. This is uh, demo. And then the password is demo. And at that point, you're talking to ClickHouse. And we can prove that by just asking it to tell us something, like select the version of the, that we have or show the tables. So um, feel free to use that URL for testing out Superset. It's our, um, our uh, plan to keep that available for as long as people are, are interested in it. Awesome. Um... Yeah, and then we can, uh, if you want, go ahead and paste that link again in the chat, Robert, just so that people you can see it. Because I think it was in the Q&A. Um, yeah, let's go cool. ahead. We're, get, we're getting some questions. Andre asks, if I'd like to export data from virtual data sets as CSV, Superset limits the result to 5,000 rows. Is there any chance to export all that data from ClickHouse? Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm less familiar with... Um, so on the superset side, I don't know the exact, I don't know if you can increase that or not. Uh, I'll have to follow up, uh, but I, I made Max a panelist so maybe maybe he'll know the answer uh, potentially. But Max, do you know anything about um, removing the limit for CSV row export? Yeah, so row limits on, on a SQL lab, you can crank up the limit in your environment. Um, so there, there's a confusing number of uh, configuration keys that you can change to control limits in superset. So my, you know, there's some limits that are related to explore, some to SQL lab, some that are related to how much you retreat, you, you send to the, the client or to, to the web browser and how much uh, on, on the CSV side. So all of that to try to prevent uh, ourselves from crashing people's web browsers or infrastructure <laughs> in general. Uh, but it's typical. I thought that the the CSV export um, default was a million, uh, and you, you can bump it. And there's ways around it. So hopefully there's some documentation around this. Maybe we'll can share, try to share some um, share some links. Otherwise, uh, you can always uh, read the code. So under uh, superset slash config.py is where all the config elements are, and I would grab or look for um, CSVs and limits as keywords and see what you find there. There is, I should say on this public endpoint, we do limit the number of rows that we permit you to come back. It looks like this one said that it came back with 2 million rows. Uh, you'll definitely hit a, you'll definitely hit a limit, but it's not a, it's pretty large. Um, I, I have found the personally that, you know, in making toy graphs, at least typically the things that I was looking at, I could limit the data in such a way that, uh, that actually the limits didn't cause me much of a problem, but that may, that's, probably not true for everyone. Yeah, I just put a link as well to at least one parameter that limits SQL max row is um, limits it 
it's to a million. So, um, yep. so, so yeah. by the way, I, t I totally get how people want to extract, you know, gigantic CSV exports and raw data, you know, into Excel and everything, but it's, it's kind of a flawed thing. In general, you, you want to, for your super fast database engine, whether it's ClickHouse or BigQuery or, so or something else to, to be doing the aggregation for you, right? There's no way right. as a human that you can consume, you know, 8 million rows. So, so it's really, uh, so you, yeah, you can think about the approach here and be like, what are you trying to achieve? And uh, what are you trying to understand and look at? Maybe a collection of queries, a better approach yeah. than uh, extracting everything. Yeah, I totally but, agree with that. That's why, that's why this limit has not been a problem for me either. For sure. Um, let's do the next uh, question. I'll do these kind of out of order a little bit. Mark Shorman asks, what are the key differentiators between ClickHouse and Druid? I'll let you take um, some Yeah, Robert. great question. Um, uh, so uh, let's talk about first about what's the same about them, um, because I think that, that that sort of frames this a little bit. So both Druid and, and ClickHouse are trying to solve a very similar problem, which is that to have a very large data set and then people asking that that questions against that data set and getting answers within a well-bounded period of time, say a second for um, for a human asking a question like, hey, you know, like slice and dice web analytics, the way you do it in, in, um, in Google Analytics, or a machine asking a question like, hey, I see a browser, you know, somebody's browsing my website, should I throw a pop-up up to ask him to subscribe? In that case, you might want an answer back in 10 to 20 milliseconds. So both systems are designed to solve that problem. The differences though, kind of start from there because uh, ClickHouse is a SQL data warehouse and it used SQL right from the start. It also has a very simple, as I mentioned, there's really just one, um, there's one uh, process that does the work. That's the ClickHouse server. When we're when we're doing um, uh, clustering, for example, replication and sharding, we use Zookeeper to to keep consensus between replicas. But we're actually eliminating that. So it's it's really just one it's really just one process. By contrast, uh, Druid has a relatively has a bunch of different types of services that you then um, have to configure to perform different operations within the um, within the cluster. Another thing about uh, Druid is that it's written in Java. So it tends to be less efficient on resources. Um, it can achieve high performance, but you tend to have to put more resources out there and you have to tune them more carefully. Uh, this is just uh, generally true of systems written in Java. I think another thing that people tend to notice is that Druid is, um, although it's very, very powerful on time series and, and, and can scale very high, it is not as good on some of the SQL features like doing joins, um, uh, sort of uh, various types of operations. Everything in ClickHouse is SQL. Uh, there's still places where uh, people tend to have to descend into JSON to get stuff work, uh, working. And those JSON interfaces have been somewhat inconsistent. That said, I'll circle back and you got to give these folks props. They were the first people to recognize this um, this problem. And so, and there's no question that Druid scales well. In fact, both systems scale well. As a follow-up to that, Max had a question. Uh, database geek question. How do data segments look like in ClickHouse? Similar to Druid, uh, Vertica, Parquet, et cetera. Yeah, so um, a great question. So ClickHouse is, I normally have a picture of this, but I kept it out for to keep things short. But we use something uh, that the workhorse table format is called merge tree. And it is basically, we store the uh, tables in, uh, obviously in column format, but what we actually do is we break up the tables into pieces. We call them parts. And it's based on a partition key. Like you might part your partition key might be month or something like that. In that case, every time you open up, every time you 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 send a bunch of data up to ClickHouse and, and add it to one of these merge tree tables, it will, let's say it comes from the month of June, it's it's you know like current data from June, it'll create a part. And then a couple of days from now, you know, you'll add more data, or maybe an hour from now, you'll add more data. So you'll get another part. And so you can think of this as, and the, the idea here is that the these parts are then just present, um, you know, within the structure that holds the table. ClickHouse knows where they are. When it needs to do a query, it will just go query all the parts, and it can it parallelizes very well across them. Now, 
as time, one of the things that ClickHouse does is over time, it does what's called a background merge, where it takes these initial parts, which are kind of small, and uh, don't allow you to have long run lengths for things like you know, like sort of being able to query uh, related data and it will merge them. And so it coalesces over time, the par parts coalesce into larger and larger ones until ClickHouse says, hey, these are just about right. I'm going to leave them, leave them alone. So it's basically columnar format parts. The parts are divided by a partition key. And then one final thing is within the parts, they are sorted um, using a, a, a an ordering. And that ordering is by default, this also used to maintain a sparse primary key index, which allows us if you're using one of those order by keys, um, we can then find data more quickly, but we don't need it. We can also just do brute force scans. Uh, and when, when you say a columnar too, it's one of these like pivoted format, right? Where you set a number of rows and a segment and you kind of twist it, you know, 90 degrees to, to right. It right. So you have them. a, you have a default, you have a, you know, like a maximum, you can have a maximum part size in general, nobody sets that because ClickHouse just kind of figures it out. But generally speaking, you're going, if you go and look in, you will see by default, um, two files for every column. One is the actual blocks of data. And then the other is what we call a mark file, which is a bunch of offsets that basically tell us how to right. get into, you know, these groups of, you know, given the ordering, like by default, tell us the beginning of the block for every 8,000. Like the parquet, a little bit like the parquet footer or yeah. something like that yeah. with offsets in it. And then yeah. you have like a bitmap. I know Druid kind of systematically originally at least had like reverse bitmap. And they have reverse bitmaps for dimensions. Um, and then uh, everything is memory map too and yep. things like that. So Yeah, anyway. the idea and the idea in all of these systems, I think Druid shares this as well to the, the index is what indexes we have in, in ClickHouse. There's two important things about indexes. One, they're sparse. So, you know, what I said about only, you know, having an entry for every 8,000 rows or so, that's to ensure that the index can fit entirely in memory. The second thing about indexes is we do have secondary indexes, but they're what are called skip indexes. So they are designed to tell you not to find things, but to tell you the things that you're not going to find. So in other words, uh, using bloom filters, for example, so that we can say, hey, you know, as we're scanning this column, we do not need to look at at 30% of the blocks because we're just not going to find the value there. So we can just reduce IO that way. Got it. Great. Um, let's see another question. Klaus asks, good presentation. Thank you. How is an entry of a new record triggered to the graph? Polling, is there a trigger in the database? Etc. They had a follow-up question around, you know, looking at temperatures, like temperature readings from a car, for example. Um, they're, they're curious to know how the data is being queried to, to kind of update the graph. Uh, from the superset side, as far as I know, uh, depending on how aggressively you, you set your refresh interval, um, your query is basically rerun again. Um, so if you have new data, um, as far as I know, you're kind of getting all that data. So if it's the last 24 hours, and it's you know it's been uh, five minutes. Then that data is being requeried. I don't know if there's anything on the ClickHouse side, Robert, um, where yeah, I think clever what's, caching or something. Go yeah, ahead. what's really relevant on ClickHouse is that that uh, when you insert something into ClickHouse, it's instantly queryable. So there are systems where you insert and then it takes a while for it to become to to materialize and actually be viewable. But um, in ClickHouse, when you do the insert it's instantly queryable in the source table. What's actually almost more important is that if you're computing aggregates off that source table, and we do this through something called a materialized views uh, view, those views are also instantly updated. So as soon as you get, uh, generally speaking, as soon as you get the response back, you know, the high sign from ClickHouse, yes, we got your block, um, you can query it. So that is, that's a really, um, that means that there's, a, you can basically between the the refresh rate and the the fact that it's instantly queryable, you can see uh, data very very quickly. Actually, uh, there's just there's, there's one here on on uh, superset versus Grafana. Do you yeah. mind if I take that? Because I go for it. Yeah. So um, how does superset compare with Grafana? Well, first of all, I want to say they both work great with with ClickHouse. We also maintain the Grafana plugin. I think the I'll, I'll mention. I mentioned two things that I think are kind of significant. One is that Grafana is very focused on, on time series. Um, and so it, it actually has a relatively small number of visualizations compared to um, 
to ClickHouse, or excuse me, to, to Superset. Um, I find when I want to, you know, like the word cloud, for example, I don't believe that exists in Grafana. I've never seen anything like it. And um, so Grafana is very focused on being able to uh, have a, you know, like a bunch of data in a time series come down, and then you can manipulate it interactively in inside the browser and, you know, sort of extend the intervals and things like that without having to go back. It's very good on that. Um, by contrast, what I love about Superset is there's just so many more ways to, to show data in, in sort of interesting and, and, and imaginative ways that allow people to use the full bandwidth of their, their, their brains to, you know, to sort of appreciate the meaning of the data. There's also a second thing which is really important, which is Grafana has no caching layer. So if everybody, if you have like a thousand people and they all have Grafana dashboards, every time they press refresh, they're all going back to the server. Click a uh, superset, I think, is, uh, you know, has the semantic layer and is able to avoid that kind of problem. Uh, so I think there's a very, um, it, it's clear that, you know, that's something which would actually be quite significant in some use cases. Yeah, well, I want to add a few things on this, but uh, one, one thing that's really clear is like, um, so there's, there's kind of the chasm in the analytics world between the operational analytics world and the business intelligence yeah. or business analytics world. And Superset is really, you know, uh, comes from, from that area of business analytics and it yeah. is pretty good at operational analytics too. And Grafana is really built with operational analytics in yep. mind, so typically we'll query time series database, a lot of like what happened the last hour, what happened in the last 90 minutes, last day or two, uh, everything, is, everything is time bound, uh, not as much dimensionality or combination of dimensions usually. That being said, I think Grafana is getting better at business analytics and Supers is getting better at, uh, at operational analytics. And we start to see that in the database world too. The database like ClickHouse, and Druid and, and, and Pino and others that are very much like good, kind of good and useful on both sides of the chasm. Yeah, and, and well. you know, there's another actually really important thing. I, that's a great point about the, the, one of the things that's great about Superset is this no code um, thing. And I, I mentioned, you know, sort of expanding the audience. Um, right now, you really have to be pretty good at programming to, you know, to use ClickHouse or to use um, Grafana effectively. And for example, you don't get much reuse of queries, um, unlike Superset, where you put it in the virtual data set, you've got sort of your base layer, and then you build on top of that. So that's something I really like about Superset. Uh, that said, I like both of them. I mean, we we have people, and I, th I think what Max said about operational versus business, I think is a really good characterization. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks. Uh, we just cleared out our Q&A queue. &Q. Uh, we're at time. Thanks, everyone, for sticking around. Uh, this was, and thanks, Robert, for the excellent uh, live demo. Yeah, yeah great. thank you. Thank you, guys. It's been just a huge pleasure working with the Superset community. Uh, yeah, and I'd say uh, go Superset. We're, we're looking forward to doing a lot more stuff with you. Great. Enjoy the rest of your day, folks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.